Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another session of Coffee Conversations with Alumni. This morning, we are joined by Dr. Claire Medendorp, who is a 2011 graduate of the PhD in Pharmaceutical Sciences program at University of Kentucky. Upon graduating, she earned a position as senior scientist at Merck, followed by roles at Millennium Pharmaceuticals and Tassaro. She currently serves as full scientist for Blueprint Medicines in Cambridge, where she works in formulation development on late stage and life cycle management programs. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and I'll hand it off to Yulia. Thanks, Rupinder. Thank you, Dr. Mindrup, for joining us today and taking the time to talk about your career path and how you got where you are today. Um, for our first question, I would like to, you to describe your average work day or work week and what some of the tasks are that you're working on. Sure, so I guess for me, I always feel like the work week can always look a little different than the next. Um, it is really project driven, um, but I guess the one thing about like small pharma, which um, Blueprint is considered, um, we try and move at an extremely rapid pace um, to get the drugs to market. Um, and so, you know, it's, it can be challenging, it can be time consuming. So a lot of um, projects, so we're a virtual company and a lot of um, small biotech are virtual companies, but we do have a lab presence as well. Um, but a lot of our um, technical batches and a lot of our, or all of our uh, clinical batches are made at a contract manufacturing facility. Um, so a lot of it nowadays is managing um, people there, the scientists that we interact with, the teams there. Um, a lot of it is internal team and timeline management. Um, it's also still designing studies, even though I don't execute them, I still have a lot to do with the design and the data analysis. Um, and then just, I guess, you know, as my career progresses and moving up, I do have a little bit more um, leadership on like CNC teams um, to now facilitate um, just stuff that will happen between CNC and the work with the overall program management teams and so trying to bridge every organization your discovery the clin farm people the clin ops people so um, it's a neat experience to have um, i've sat on just the cnc side of teams for such a long time that it's nice to really get even more of a broader picture of um, pharmaceutical development So how has that changed from before COVID to now? I'm assuming that now you're working from home, but before, yeah. how was that? <laughs> yeah, um, so I think being a virtual company, it's, it's kind of easy to still maintain all of the work that we were doing beforehand. Um, I think that we were fortunate. I know that my husband works at Vertex, and so there have been um, a few uh, shutdowns at some of their sites that they do manufacturing. So I know that it is happening. It just fortunately hasn't happened to us for them to, you know, take that two-week period to clean, make sure everybody's safe and healthy. Um, so we've been very fortunate that all of our supply operations have really been maintained, all of the commercial supply maintained, um, but I think it's probably challenging for others. And it was definitely challenging when China was shut down. We do do a lot of work um, with our drug substance in China, so that we've tried to maintain supply on as best as possible. <laughs> that sounds challenging, <laughs> especially <laughs> travel restrictions and all of that. Um, can you yeah. tell us a little bit tell us about some of the projects that you're currently working on? Sure, so um, Blueprint Medicines, um, in case you all didn't, hadn't seen, um, is an oncology company um, and it works on kinase inhibitors. And so a lot of the medicines that we're developing are actually more for mutations um, to other uh, cancers. So we have one drug on the market that's 
for gastrointestinal stromal tumors, just is much easier to say. Um, and then we filed uh, another um, NDA for um, small cell lung cancer um, and also medullary thyroid cancer. Um, the, the market for the GIST um, is small because it's driven by a certain kinase inhibitor um, that we don't see a ton of mutations yet in. Um, but that program, I'm actually working on the pediatric. This is one of the struggles to COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Children not getting along. <laughs> um, but that program, I'm working on the pediatric um, dosage form, which is, I think, interesting in itself. It's one of the first ones I've worked on. And just challenging in that um, a lot of pharmaceutical companies really focus on the adult formulation, and then we try and move down to the pediatric dosage form. Okay, so um, sorry, we have um, a form a formulation that's developed for the adults that we're now trying to go as quick again as possible and, you know, focus on like mini tablets or a coated granulation, something like that, that we can, again, keep moving forward and moving fast instead of having to develop a liquid formulation um, or anything like that. Um, then another program that I'm working on, um, uh, it's a very interesting program. Um, because we've just seen some challenges with biorelevant dissolution. And also the animal PK studies gave us um, a little cause for concern because a lot of the people that are gonna need this medication are on proton pump inhibitors. And so um, it's been kind of a rush to develop two formulations in parallel um, to, while we'd not like to develop an enabling formulation, we may be driven to that just depending on some of the other studies that are happening. Um, and then, as I said, I get to leave the CMC for another program, um, which falls into uh, another RET inhibitor for non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and then other than that, I have a couple of people that report into me that do a lot of the pre-formulation work that we have there, solid state characterization, helping with GLP tox, um, vehicle formulation development. So um, there's, yeah, that, it's so nice to work at a small pharmaceutical company because you really get to wear a lot of different hats and just get to see a lot of different areas of development. Yeah, we've been hearing that a lot from alumni, how you, the difference between big pharma and small pharma. It's one of the things that comes up most often. So since yeah. you just mentioned people reporting to you, what's the background of the people in your team and what are some of the skills that people need to have to work on a team like yours? Sure. So um, one, so the people that report in to me have more of actually a chemistry background. Um, the girl that started working with me um, initially, she's an organic chemist by training, but she also spent some time in parenteral development at Catalan in San Diego. Then we've had another girl just recently join us that actually had a contract position at Novartis that was kind of doing the same pre-formulation work, but um, again, has more of a chemistry um, undergraduate and master's degree. Um, sorry, you guys are going to get to meet Taylor too. <laughs> um, so uh, other than that, so for skills, I mean, in the pre-formulation area, it's been really nice having someone that at least had a lot with the parenteral development. She's been great at developing a lot of the GLP taught formulations. Sorry, guys. Um, so um, it's nice to have the organic chemistry side because that was never really one of my strong or passionate um, areas of learning and research. Uh, so she brings that really nice organic chemistry side to things. Um, then I guess for the other people that join our group, what Challenging for um, small pharma, and especially for us, we have a smaller group of people, is you do need someone that has 
at least two to three years of experience already working um, usually with a CDMO or at least developing formulation or a process. Um, it's kind of hard to take somebody that's fresh out of school because um, we just don't have the time to really give to a lot of coaching, which is definitely unfortunate. Um, so I think like the better area to break in through is more of that pre-formulation side for small, well, at least for us at our company. Um, and then, I mean, I would really say, and this may be even one of the future questions, like I was fortunate to start out at large pharma and get a role where you're completely hands-on with the formulation and process development. So I spent all of my time in a solid suite um, working on wet granulation, dry granulation, blending, milling, tablets, capsules, hot melt extrusion. Like I just felt that was such a good um, learning experience, hands-on experience for me. I'm one of those people that really likes to have that hands-on. I don't really like to do that. I mean, there's so many people that can learn with books and do such a great job. I'm not one of them. I really do love like the hands-on part of it. Um, so I would say for me, that was like one of the best experiences because I got to see, got to physically touch and figure out like, what the challenges are, what the process parameters are that are really important, do a lot of statistical modeling, design of experiments, just so much hands-on stuff that has really helped me now manage those contract manufacturing facilities because I feel like I can have more of that technical conversation. I understand the equipment a little bit better, which I like to do. I think my engineering side comes out more because that was my undergraduate degree than probably all of my pharmaceutics learning at Kentucky, which is fine. It was still good. I needed that. Um, but I really do like that late stage um, engineering, all the equipment and stuff like that. So. so what then encouraged you to switch from big pharma to small pharma? Um, well, I guess, so my husband got a job at Vertex, and so the family moved to Boston, um, and I did not, uh, we kind of wanted to separate then. He had also worked at Merck. Um, so I interviewed at Millennium, which at that time was still just a subsidiary of um, Takeda. It hadn't fully integrated at the time. So they were still small, but they had a product on the market. They had several moving through the market and they still had the backing of Takeda and they also had labs. So I was still able to like bring some of that large pharma and in lab experience to kind of get my foot in the door there as well. And then they still had that virtual component though, where all of the clinical manufacturing was made at contract manufacturing facilities. So it was nice to kind of, still have my technical background, but then also start to manage other people outside of the organization. Um, and then I think just as I got more experience in the late stage um, and felt more confident in what knowledge I did have and what I was capable of doing, I then uh, just looked at Tesaro for another opportunity to take a molecule that was um, post the registration. So you need registration batches made that get set up on a 12, well, much longer stability, but you usually need 12 months of stability in order to file um, your NDA and your MAA. Um, and so that was kind of like where my niche was. And so I went there to kind of just see what all I could do um, for a much, much longer. We had a formulation development group of three for solid oral. Um, so very, very small from where I was coming from. Um, and then just as a career gap, um, I really wanted to get that early stage experience, kind of head back more towards my um, PhD roots um, and do some pre-formulation and early discovery work. Um, and so Blueprint was my next opportunity. And so that's, that's where I've landed now. <laughs> So what skill from graduate school have prepared you best for your position? Or, or what are some things that we should learn now to make us more competitive on the job market? The one thing I always loved and appreciated about 
the school UK part of it that I attended was, and at the time I didn't like it, <laughs> presenting all of the time. <laughs> we presented <laughs> um, and just tons of, like I said, we had a weekly meeting um, with a couple of the professors that I don't think any of them are there anymore, but we had a weekly meeting where I think at least once a month we had to present. Um, then my teacher, as um, he, his team grew, Dr. Uh, Tong Lai Lee, who's now at Purdue. Um, so as his team grew, we started having our own group meetings that we were required to present in. And then maybe you guys still have as part of your um, curriculum presenting to the entire um, division <laughs> there. Uh, but I, I mean, it's so true. Like you have to have confidence and be able to communicate um, your data or your thoughts, anything just to different groups of scientists and just getting that experience to like know your audience, know that you're not always talking to people that do formulation development around the clock. So I think like that was one of the biggest things um, that just really helped prepare me for the industry. Um, and sorry, what was the other part of the question? Oh uh, yeah, what's, oh a, what's a skill that we should learn now to make us more oh. Um, That was a tough one when I was looking at it because everybody's kind of different. Um, and I don't know what areas of everything that you're <laughs> coming from. So um, just for, for pre-formulation or formulations in general. Okay. And um, I guess we are probably interested in that. <laughs> okay. Um, I think one of the things too is the writing component to it. I, that was always like I had complete like energy activation barrier to sit down and write. Um, that's what took me the longest to get done with this wonderful PhD is actually sitting down to write it. Um, I much prefer just the doing part of it. Um, but I think like having that having more papers um i i know that that's probably what the professors tell you too but it is really true um because it really does help you to write the reports i think one of the things that i found lacking um at merck and even at takeda was the reports and so when you get to that um, point in time where you have to write an nba or the maa you need that supporting documentation. And so when you have to pull back through presentations and things like that, because people didn't take the time to write the report, it's very, very frustrating because then you have to write the report and try and tell the story. And I feel like a lot of the times I just had to sit and look at the data and then make up the story <laughs> as we went along. So I, I would say if, if you don't love writing, because you still don't really love it, but it's such a good thing to be practicing and doing. Sorry, Dave, if you're still listening. <laughs> Don't love writing. How has your work-life balance evolved throughout your career, and especially with the changes from big pharma to small, or smaller, smaller, smaller pharma? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a, a tough one. So. Um, I have at Tesoro and at Takeda, um, being in life, like that later stage in life cycle management or doing all of the validation, you do spend a lot of time traveling and going to the CDMOs in order to oversee the manufacturing. I mean, those, the registration batches, your clinical manufacturing batches, your validation batches, they're pretty much the most important. I mean, you'd never want to fail any of those batches. And so we, we typically provide, we don't necessarily have to provide oversight on all of the clinical manufacturing, but registration, you're there the entire time and validation, you're there the entire time. So it's nice when some of those places are here in the US, but a lot of the times they're also in Europe. Um, and so it's definitely stressful to have to travel all the time and also to have um, little kids. And to be honest, that's kind of why I did take the blueprint job too, because I was doing a ton of traveling and not a lot of time at home with the little ones. Um, so I think the small, the larger pharmaceutical companies, while I did some of that, you have a longer timeline too to do development. And so you can really work to answer a lot of questions and you could do it in-house. You don't always have to rely on the CDMOs to do those for you. 
Um, so I think, yeah, you re at each individual person, you have to just ask yourself really what you want to do, what you want to get out of things. Um, I loved that I got to travel and not that I necessarily got to see a lot of places because <laughs> you do spend a lot of time in the manufacturing suite. Um, but again, like I said, I love the hands-on stuff. And while I can't touch anything, I love being there and just seeing how things are going, making sure that everything is going right. Um, the smaller pharmaceutical companies aren't really going to afford you a lot of that opportunity necessarily to have complete work-life balance. Um, it ebbs and flows, though, too. Um, but I love being busy, and I, I, I love what I do. That's, I mean, one of the most important things as well, too. Um, and also, I mean, just getting to show your kids, like, how dedicated and how medicine can change um, people's diseases and things like that. So it's to each their own, um, but definitely you're going to get a little bit more life, life work balance um, at large pharma. <laughs> Is it just maybe also because you have a bigger team and you can distribute things and you don't have to do everything? yourself it's or... theme and it's time yeah they don't um so while large pharma i mean it's i, I work there i wouldn't trade it for the world and <laughs> lots of good medications coming out of them as well too but you just don't you have money backing you um and so you're not relying on investors so when you're doing that you really have to rush to market um the best product that you can and they just don't have to do that <laughs> Um, so again, back to early careers, what is something that you would like somebody to tell you before you graduated? What would have been the best tip that you could give yourself from your position now back then? Pay attention to Dr. Anderson and all of his, uh, <laughs> chemical equilibria. <laughs> I guess he's probably not teaching anymore, but that class, yeah. I mean, that's for pre-formulation and just, um, I think I didn't have a lot of that appreciation of um, the uh, bio-relevant, the animal PK. Um, I, I, I think I've gained a lot more of that over the years. So if I could have spent a little bit more time um, trying to understand like some of the DMPK. I think like you, at least for us or for me, I got maybe one or two classes on it with Dr. McNamara and then that was it. Um, but it's, it's such an interesting side of things that I'm seeing now, um, doing more of the early stage work um, that I'm glad I'm getting the chance to do it where I think I maybe could have done better starting out if I had a little bit more background with that. So it's just more spread on top of the depth in your specific particular area. Definitely. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. I think we're, we have this uh, intro, I don't know what it's called now. When I took it, it was called intro to farm side where you get a little bit overview of everything, which I thought was mm -hmm. helpful. I don't, I, yeah. Yeah. They changed their name so many times that I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what type of, or are there any entry level positions specifically at Blueprint or in small farmer in particular, or is that more difficult for people straight out of graduate school to get into compared to big pharma? Yeah, I think it, it probably does vary, but at least at Tesoro and Blueprint, it would be a really tough sell to take um, someone fresh out of graduate school, unfortunately, yeah. Um, I think if you had maybe um, an internship um, that you did already work in pharma, um, that would probably help you even just get in the door at the place that you did work. Um, but it would help at least smaller pharmaceutical companies see and definitely use that person that whoever you are working with as a reference so they could speak to um, all of the work that you did there. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, large to medium pharma is probably the way to go at least first. I know um, Vertex is usually always hiring. They're doing <laughs> wonderful things. Um, and I guess I am a little biased since someone works there, but um, 
Yeah, I guess there's, there are so many jobs, though, in the Boston area that if you could just get that two to three years experience, you can almost write your ticket um, in formulation and drug product development because I don't feel like there are a ton of people. And I guess a lot of people, too, it, it seems to vary on, like, where people are from. Not everybody wants to live on one of the coasts. Um, but I think there are a lot of job opportunities in the Boston area because small biotechs are always popping up there. So if you could just get that few years of experience under your belt, it would be, yeah, the, the opportunities will open up for you. <laughs> that sounds promising. I don't yeah. know if I'm, a, if I'm a coast person. I haven't made up my mind yet. <laughs> I'm a mountain person. so Yeah. Yeah, and it it was hard for me to leave Kentucky. I grew up here in Kentucky, um, so it was definitely difficult to fly out of Lexington Bluegrass Airport and see the farms and then land in Newark, New Jersey, where the lady next to me was like, welcome to the car theft capital of the world. I was like, why did I leave Kentucky? <laughs> well, you just, I guess you just have to find a spot that you like and then try yeah. there <laughs> yeah definitely uh so how has the field of formulation design changed of from when you started to now is there technology wise or what types of formulations are used and um it's so uh, when i was thinking about that i mean i know there are things so i mean obviously the enabling formulations, they're becoming a bit more prevalent. Um, a lot of people are spray drying, doing hot melt extrusion, nano milling. Um, but I think still like the contract manufacturing facilities that we work with, they still are pretty just standard in their types of equipment and development. So, I mean, the pharma industry, while academia is so great and does such novel and interesting things, the industry doesn't always pick them up um, <laughs> because it's always hard to be like that first person. So, I mean, I guess I don't to do this, um, but this is my husband's, well, he doesn't do the continuous manufacturing, but at least works at Vertex doing the continuous manufacturing. I think that's probably one of the biggest strides, but I think at the time too, like when we were both in school there at UK, um, they were doing in Dr. Lauder's lab a lot of PAT. And while I think they've used that uh, quite a bit in the continuous manufacturing um, processes, it's also been a burden. Um, and so they're actually trying to get away and do some other things for the inline monitoring than the standard um, PAT that was there. Um, so I think it just, it kind of depends on the company. I mean, they've been, they've dedicated everything to continuous manufacturing. Um, and I guess if you need an alumni there, <laughs> you guys could always ask him too, but um, they, I think they kind of like drew a line in the sand and said we were going to be the innovators on this. And so while there's some other big pharma that have done it as well too, I think Vertex is really proud of leading um, the way in the continuous manufacturing. The only thing for companies like mine though is again, we're working in like very niche areas of oncology space. And so we're never going to have batch sizes that drive <laughs> continuous manufacturing. So everything is still like maintaining fairly standard for us. But at the same time, it, you'll find it's so funny, like some pe every, I don't know if you all heard this phrase, but everybody believes they're a formulator. So every department, every area, they will think that they understand and know formulations. And just to give one example, we have the product I said we had on the market for just um, we have a compound following on that's not, it's going to be a similar target, but it's going to be used for mast cell disorders instead. Um, and so, you know, everybody's like, well, you, you've already got a tablet for this one. Can't you just make a tablet? It's just, we're just giving you another drug substance. And we're just like, head smack, like, it's not how it works. 
And so it's so funny. We were like, okay, this is what we'll do. We'll try and measure all of the physical chemical properties. If they match up to our molecule that's on the market, we will start there with the formulation. It has been a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the physical chemical properties have been somewhat similar, they just not manufacture the same. The drug substance is more hygroscopic. We're having issues, that's the one that we're having issues with some of the performance in animals and the PP, and we're just like, it does not work that way, people. So, um, yeah, I think even though you say, like, things do stay standard, it is and it's not. Like, each molecule is its own beast. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, what are some of the key turning points or obstacles throughout your career that steered your decision making and switching jobs and sometimes stuff and have what for some of the inputs maybe from mentors or other people that have helped you figure out where to go and what to do yeah so i give my husband a lot of trouble about leaving Merck when he did because I just tell him all the time I'm like I only needed one more year and I would have just even known more about all of the equipment and everything that I was working on um, but at the same time um, I got to work with um, a, a man there that actually he's a Wisconsin um, grad back when Dr. Bummer was finishing his um, degree um, or postdoc, postdoc there. And so we kind of hit it off, which is having that connection. Um, but then later he ended up becoming my boss. And it was a good mentorship in that, like, he was also still searching for certain things in his career. And he was just one of those people that could really identify, like, gaps that you have to and like really be good at mentoring to those gaps like trying to find we we give him the hardest time when he'd show up at mine and um, the girl that worked in my office's door he'd knock on the door and we'd be like career development opportunity Ray and he'd be like I was thinking <laughs> like he would all but he really like he always tried to find something for he was always working to develop people and that Dr. Bummer I think was that way too like he was just so good at finding people's strengths and their weaknesses and trying to like work and navigate both of those um, and so uh, having somebody like that I think is really good I, so I, I don't work for him anymore but um, we talk almost monthly to just kind of check in and be like uh, and when I wanted to move from Tesaro, I was just like, right, this is my career gap. This is it, right? And he's like, yeah, this is it. You need to either do this or you got to do this. And so I was like, okay, well, then I'll go this way right now. So, I mean, people that you can really talk to about those things and um, are for no reason at all really invested in like you, it's really nice to find someone that you can rely on and trust for things like that. How do you find that person? <laughs> um, yeah so I, I mean again it's it's up to each individual and we um I, I, you guys have heard of the Myers-Briggs but at Blueprint we take the insights course I don't know if you guys have heard of that but it's color blocks and essentially um everybody has, um, you know, a way that they will work. It's similar to Myers-Briggs, but instead it's just colors. And so um, a lot of us being a pharmaceutical company, the color blue, which is liking data, needing to analyze things like order and structure and things like that. Um, but I think, you know, don't, don't ever let like any concern you may have about like, not knowing certain things and not wanting to ask the question, like just, I'd say if you can, you're not always gonna have the best boss either. I've had a couple of cruddy bosses as well too, but finding that person at the company that you can talk to that maybe, so for instance, if it's not where this 
guy actually started, he was, he started in formulations before I was there, moved to analytical. So when I started there, he was actually an analytical. It's nice to find those people in other departments at well. It doesn't have to just be your boss because then you even get to learn like other areas by talking to them. I'd say companies too, when you kind of go for interviews, what you may want to just ask as a question is about maybe some mentor programs um, cause each company will be different. And I think a lot of them actually do have some mentoring programs. We specifically at Blueprint have mentor mentee programs. And so you can either put your, you know, name in the hat to be mentored and say like, these are the areas I want to be mentored in. Or if you have a certain person, you can even just pick that person, um, to do it. So, I mean, it's all developing relationships is actually like one of the most important things. Um, and I know that's sometimes going to be hard for people because a lot of people are introverts. I have one daughter that I'm going to have to like do something to get her to just talk to people. But um, I think that's just me. developing this, is that you? That's totally yeah, that's fine. Me. I get it. I totally get it. There are certain times where I just, I just, I don't want to be a people person, but it's so, so helpful to, to develop those relationships and being an introvert like you don't need 500 relationships you can just find the perfect two that fit for you too like <laughs> it doesn't mean you got to have this huge space of relationships like finding those key people and also find I guess like leaders that you can kind of read and see people that are leading people that are leading teams people that lead a division um, or people that just maybe like have you can recognize maybe that knack for going to be a leader someday I think those are probably like some of the good ones to get some mentoring from that's good advice yeah um are there any questions from the audience just put them in the chat box or um, mute yourself Well, while we while we wait, um, uh, one one last question from my end. What are some of the big obstacles or challenges that you think that we will face as soon to be PhDs when we enter the job market? Hmm. <clears throat> I guess I mean I don't really know right now with COVID <laughs> yeah. how many people are doing a lot. I mean, I know we do some hiring from time to time. Uh, people aren't relocating right now um, just because, I mean, we're all working from home. Um, but I don't, I don't know. You may not, like I said, you may not always have a boss that's perfect. Um, it may not be starting out either like the perfect job that you've been looking for but um getting your foot in the door gaining the experience that you can um absorbing and learning everything that you can on the job and then starting to look for something better um i think you know i, I hate to say settling because <laughs> it's not necessarily settling but um you can learn something from every job if if you want to that's true yeah even a bad experience is an experience and you learn something from it yeah 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 i i mean i definitely through the years learn more from the failures that we've had and come across than you do from the successes for sure well because then you have to figure out what went wrong if exactly magically works then you don't know why exactly i i think the toughest thing for me was um in life cycle management at merck um while the process may not necessarily be known if you're bringing on one of the competitors compounds that's coming off patent to do like a bilayer formulation um with it but we i had not failed a single clinical manufacturing batch in Tultasaro. And then when it happened, I was like, what do you mean we failed? I've <laughs> never failed a batch before. This can't have happened. So I think that was, that was a nice humbling experience. <laughs> I have a question. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, so on post graduation, um, there are a breadth of opportunities and paths that you can um, go down. Can you describe some of your thought process of deciding exactly the path that you want to go on? Um, hmm. Can you say the first part of the question again? Sorry. So, so, so in post-graduation, um, um, <clears throat> Um, and like I'm um, specifically in like pharmaceutical sciences, there are many routes that we can take, um, either government, industry, academia, small, big, um, the opportunities are kind of endless with our degree. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to know how did you decide uh, which path fit best for you? And what were some possibly some tools that you used to um, navigate the fields and yourself and the values that you have and how those fit in with your career? Well, since I was brutally honest and told you that I'm not a lover of writing, I knew academia wasn't going to be my path. Um, so that, that was definitely out. Um, as far as the government option, I never, I don't know, I never really considered it and I think if it was something that I was a bit more passionate about now I think having more experience at a pharmaceutical company would probably help me do a better job with the government because you really know the struggles um, you know more of like the reasons for doing certain development paths I think one of the good things, nice things always is sometimes with like AAPS and other conferences, having um, interactions with the agencies um, and getting to talk about some of these things is always really interesting. But again, like I said, I'm, I'm very much of a hands-on learner. So I don't think if I would have had that pharmaceutical industry first that I really would have grasped what I maybe needed to do as a FDA type person. Um, then I guess, so my two options were pre-formulation and formulation development. And while I thought that I would do better um, in pre-formulation because of my PhD background, um, that that's where I was going to end up. But when I interviewed for the position, it was Shearing Plow at the time, Mark had not bought them yet. Um, when I interviewed for the position there, I did both one pre-formulation and one um, formulation job. And again, just talking to the person that was hiring for those different positions, um, I, I liked the formulation person a lot better. Um, I think that we, I, I thought we were going to mesh well and I would learn more um, from her. And so I kind of just went with my gut on that. And that's where I ended up. Um, and I, again, like I said, I love the engineering side of things. So I think that that took me down that trajectory. But then seeing what my career gaps were, um, I then wanted to shift and have the opportunity to do so um, at Blueprint. So I think it, I don't know if I would have had the same good experiences that I had like going with my gut that time and saying that formulations might be better. Cause I think everybody tells you, or at least told me um, starting out 95% um, or what of molecules fail and you'll never see a molecule make it to the market. And I've launched two um, products. So it's been, it's been a good, a good career path. I think. Thank you. Anybody else have a question from the audience? <clears throat> We're quiet today. <laughs> Don't be shy. What's something we should be asking you but haven't? Oh, I forgot about that one. <laughs> Boy. Uh, oh. Flipping it on me. Darn. Um. Oh, you guys had really good questions. I feel like I was able to convey most of the things. Um, 
I think, I mean, everybody has like kind of ideas of what they want to do um, and their career paths. Um, but maybe just don't be afraid to step outside of the box and try something different, something new. Um, Cause I think that's afforded me more opportunities um, is to take some of those chances um, and finding the right, like I said, finding the right mentor um, to do some of those things has really been um, helpful because I mean, at least with the one that I, I spoke to you guys about um, from time to time, he's um, gone on to do some interesting things and in leading just CMC group of one, which is himself. Um, <laughs> and so just talking to him, it's kind of something that I aspire to, but at the same time, it's also terrifying because like I said, I don't love organic chemistry. Um, but again, building relationships, I know like at least a handful of process chemists that I pick up the phone and call right away and be like, can you consult for me? Um, this is the opportunity I have. Could you like help me do X, Y, and Z? There's a couple of analytical chemists too that I would feel so comfortable with calling. So I don't feel anymore like I have to know everything to be able to make that leap. It was more making the right relationships meeting the right people um, that I feel confident in using as consultants to be able to do those other um, areas of development that I have enough knowledge to guide maybe a CDMO of where we need it, but I don't have the technical background if things were to go awry. So networking and knowing people. It is, and that's not what necessarily, yeah, it's not necessarily um, like for trying to get a job with their company, but just them giving you the right guidance too um, and things. But yes, networking, it does, it really does help a ton um, because we do, I mean, we try to where we can, um, especially at Small Pharma, hire people too that we've worked with, or at least for consulting. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's nice. Just this, I guess one thing, the pharma industry, it's not really that big. So wherever you can, try not to burn any bridges. <laughs> we'll try our best. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, Thank you so much for your time this morning and answering yeah, of course. our million questions. This was very informative and hopefully we will be able to meet you in person someday at the college, hopefully soon. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, and um, I know Katina has all of my information and maybe Julia, do you all do too? So if anybody wants to reach out, um, definitely email my work account. I see those emails a lot more. I might be slow to answer, <laughs> but I do see those emails come through. Thank you. Sure, of course. Good luck to you guys. Enjoy, enjoy graduate school. It still all of it goes by too quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Menendorf. Uh, Have a good course. rest of your and day. And please call me Claire, you guys. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.